Great, let's have a pray and we'll ask for God's help. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we are just, we stand amazed at your word. We are amazed at this um, true story that you have given to us, that you have revealed wonderful things to us. And we pray now for minds that are open and able to understand and hearts that will understand and rejoice. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, Well, we're going to be thinking about um, the new heaven and the new earth. What happens after this life? Um, And have you ever had a conversation like this with a friend, Um, maybe someone who's, who's not a Christian, and... You, you get chatting, and uh, they say, do you, know, do you believe in heaven? And you go, yeah, yeah, I do, yeah, it's a, it's a real place. Um, and they say, so what, what happens there? And you go, well, it, it lasts forever. And they go, forever? That seems like a really long time. Um, won't you get bored? And then you sort of think, yeah. And the thing is, we have an imagination problem. We cannot imagine something that good that lasts for that long. We just can't imagine. In our, uh, in our sinfulness um, and in our self-centeredness, we just, uh, and in our lack of faith of seeing the goodness of Jesus, we just can't get our heads around just being fully delighted in Jesus for all eternity. And we struggle to long for that, don't we? Because we don't see the goodness of it. And that's my big thing today, is that um, I want to help us, and I think this helps us, to long for heaven more rightly and with a greater joy and a greater anticipation. And the great gift that the Bible is, is this comes right at the end of the Bible. And we've got this whole story that builds and builds and builds this tension of, and then there's heaven. And when we know the whole story, we go, oh, yes, that is just what my soul has been thirsting for. That is what I want. And a good story builds tension and it creates moments when that tension is realized and released. We see this all the time. You can look out for it in every story that you see. And if you watch um, films and uh, and good uh, stories with kids, you'll notice a good story when they start asking all the questions. What's going to happen? Why did he do that? And you go, yeah, yeah, they're building the tension. That's the the point of the story. You'll find out. You'll find out. And you see this in romance stories. Will they or won't they? And the tension goes back and forward. Um, And then the final scene is the wedding day. Oh, and because you've been on that journey, the wedding day is is glorious. Um, My wife, Abby, has been watching a TV show, um, a romance show. um, And the episodes are nearly an hour long. And they the main couple, they did not kiss until episode six. That's six hours of TV until you get that moment. Um, Another great story is a powerful enemy who reigns and rules with terror. Darth Vader, Sauron, Sid from Toy Story. Will there ever be victory over this great enemy? And the story is a story of a victory over an enemy. Or maybe there are stories of great suffering. Um, I can recommend a movie. Um, it's A Man Called Otto. Has anyone seen that? Yeah, I, I quite enjoyed it. It's a man about his wife dies. He retires from his work. His neighborhood goes to pot. It's not how he wants it to be. It's a really sad story of loss and mourning. And the question is, will the tears ever stop? Or do the tears have any meaning or purpose? Will the depression end? And it's a story of seeking to find meaning, 
in the tears. And the Bible is that story. And the great thing is we get to be a part of that story. And in this part of Revelation, we see the final scene, but just like the final scene of a rom-com where you see there's a wedding, you can see that and you go, I understand what's happening, it's a wedding. But if you haven't seen the story before, you won't understand just how glorious that wedding is. And so a lot of what we see is imagery that is rich and dense, and it points us back to the story that has come before. A story that we're in, that we feel, and a story that we can be part of. Um, just an example of this, I, I met a couple recently who had a baby. And that's a story that you hear a lot. But when I heard their backstory, the baby that they had was miraculous, was truly incredible. And it changes the meaning. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We know that we're heading for heaven because the Bible tells us. But as we see what comes before, we can long there rightly. Um, and the first thing you see on the handout is I've, I've put... Um, I haven't got one. It's a, uh, it's a chiasm. Oh, I found it. <laughs> um, there, in verses 1 to 5, what we see is something called a chiasm. And this is a, it's a Bible technique of, of writing things. And it's, it's like climbing up a mountain that leads to a peak in the middle. And we see there, in, we'll, we'll start from the beginning and the end, it sort of reflects itself. So in verses 1 and verse 5, um, it, they're speaking about a new heaven and a new earth, verse 1. And in verse 5, the one who on the throne says, I am making everything new. Heaven is a starting anew, a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. And then we go inwards. Verse 1b and verse 4, each of those verses declares that there'll be no more or no longer something that is bad. In verse 1 it says, there is no longer any sea. The sea is the, is the place where the beasts dwell, where dangerous things are, where um, it's chaotic and unpredictable and dangerous. And in verse 4, we see, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Those things of this world which are wrong will pass away. And that leads us into the middle of the chiasm. And there we have two um, wonderful pictures in verse 2. And I think the meaning in verse 3, which is the same thing. So in verse 2, he says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God. Heaven is a city and prepared as a bride. Heaven is a wedding, a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And in verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. Heaven is a picture of God dwelling with his people. It's a picture of relationship of marriage of a bride and a bridegroom. And it's a picture of a city, a group of people in unity living under one ruler. Um, so we're going to go through those um, one by one, the, those stories, the story of God's holy city, uh, the brides and God's dwelling place. But first, let's think about no more suffering and death. And we know that the sto this story begins right at the start of the Bible in Genesis, where death comes into the world along with sin. Adam and Eve, they disobey God. They do that one thing which God said not to do. And with that came separation from God 
and entered the world, death and suffering and pain. And this really helps our, our relationship and understanding of those things. They're not right. They're not meant to be here. And one day they will be gone. People often say, don't they, that the suffering question, how does God allow suffering? That proves he's not good. I actually wonder if we try to skip past the suffering thing too quickly. Um, one of my kids um, got stung by a wasp today, and I, my parents' advice was, it'll hurt for a bit, then you'll be fine. Um, I want this suffering thing to be over and done with as quickly as possible. I don't really want to think about it. But the Bible gives us lament, doesn't it? It gives us a way of weeping over things that are truly sad. The Bible is a story full of plagues, floods, death, war, and all these things are wrong. They're not meant to be here. And as we suffer, we can say sad things are sad because they are a reminder to us that we are fallen and that this world is not as it's meant to be and one day it won't be. Isn't that gloriously hopeful? What about the story of the holy, God's holy city? Um, Note, it's coming down out of heaven from God. This is the opposite to man-made religion, epitomized in the Tower of Babel, where man tried to build their way up to God in their own strength, and God said no, and squashed their efforts. This is God's work. The heavenly city comes down from God. Um, and don't we love this story of a, of a holy city? Do we talk about this all the time. How can we make the place that we live in better? How can we get along better with each other? Who should we vote for? What policies do we think will make this city, town better? better? What policies do we think will make this place worse? Whose rule shall we live under? The story of a city of people dwelling together, living under a ruler, is a story that humanity has been obsessed with. And the Bible teaches us a wonderful story where God is preparing a particular people seen first in the Jews in Israel and later so that the whole nations can see his church is this holy city, a group of people living in perfect unity with one another. Um, it's a great story and it ends with this holy city coming down from heaven. Um, what about the bride? Uh, the city is prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Um, we see allusions to this further back in Revelation in, in chapter 19. In fact, you can see it on this page, top left-hand corner, 19 verse 7. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given uh, to wear. Um, in, in John chapter 3, uh, John the Baptist says, a person can only receive what is given them from heaven. And then he goes on to talk about the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The church is destined for a wedding, beautifully dressed for her husband. The day will come when this union will be fully realized. Um, the city and the bride are the same thing. And that is the story of the Bible, isn't it? All through the Old Testament. <coughs> God's people, will they, won't they? Will they end up as the beautiful bride for the groom? It's the story of the church. Will the church remain faithful? Will they hold on and will they become the beautiful bride for the groom. And all this points us to verse 3. 
which says the dwelling place of God is with man. Um, and, and again, this is the thing that we can't imagine. This is where our imagination problem comes. We can't imagine how good it will be to dwell with God in perfect unity. To be with him, to be in his presence, and for it to be... I, I, see, I, I haven't even got words. We just cannot imagine the goodness of that. And it's the story of the whole Bible. God dwelling with his people in the wilderness, in the tabernacle, his presence coming into the temple in Jerusalem. In John 1, John the Baptist said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus made his dwelling place physically with human beings. And then in, in Revelation, we see hints of this. Um, dwelling among. Uh, the word dwell among is the same word as a protective presence of God. It says in, in Revelation 7.15, it uses the phrase, God will shelter them with his presence. It's a protective dwelling. When we dwell with God, we are in complete safety. And the story of the whole Bible is one where God and man are drawing closer to one another. Until we reach heaven and we are with him fully at the wedding. And it's hard to imagine, isn't it? And we have conversations with friends where we say, yeah, I can, it does seem like it could be a bit boring. And if, if that is true, either the Bible is wrong or we have missed something. We can't get our heads around how good it will, it will be. And there's a couple applications here as we, um, as we finish up. Um, we see the word thirsty used in verse 6 and the word victorious in verse 7. And I'm going to encourage us to, to go away with those words in mind. Let's go away um, thirsty as a good thing. We want to be thirsty. And going away longing to be victorious and how to be victorious. Um, let's look at thirsty. We see that in verse 6. He said to me, it's done. I'm the alpha and the omega. That's the beginning and the end. That's the first and last letter of, of the alphabet. The beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. He gives water to the thirsty. <clears throat> and I'm going to think about this in a couple of ways. I think first, we first, for our need for salvation... And I think, secondly, we first, for our need to be with God and to see him glorified. So first, for our, first for our need for salvation. Um, and we see this in the Gospels. If we compare a first for the water that comes from Jesus, compared with the Pharisees' attitude towards Jesus in the Gospels, the Pharisees in Jesus' day... They were not thirsty. They were religious. They were doing good deeds. They were pleased with their performance. They took pride in it. Progress for them was being less thirsty. I am less in need of God because my good works have got me closer to him. And I need a bit less grace. I need less mercy. I need less forgiveness. Along comes Nicodemus the Pharisee, to come and speak to Jesus, and he says, you must be born again. He's saying, do you not realize how thirsty you are, Nicodemus? You are in desperate need of salvation, and you do not realize. Jesus compares the Pharisee and the tax collector. The tax collector realized he was thirsty. He beat his chest, repentant, Aware of his failings, 
and desperate for salvation. Look at the water that Jesus offers. He offers us water without cost. That's the only water that is available. The Pharisees, they wanted to pay for their water with their good works. And that water isn't there. You can't buy it. The Christian believer comes empty-handed. The only water we can drink is free. It has been paid for by someone else. Jesus says in Matthew 5, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Throughout the Christian life, we might expect that the Pharisee mindset can creep in, can't it? I think we, sometimes we expect over time that the, the more holy we become, the more Christ-like we become, which we should expect, the less I depend on God. But the reality is, actually, we grow in dependency on God. We grow in our thirstiness, in our need to drink the water that Jesus offers And that is so true, isn't it? Each day we aim to be more like Christ, we need more grace. First, because I sin every day and I need grace every day. But secondly, the knowledge of myself grows and I see my own heart a bit more clearly each day. And there's stuff in there that I am surprised by and I think, well, I've had more grace than I realized for my whole life. And I will need more than I realize into the future. The more we grow, the more we depend. And the thirstier we become, and the more water we drink, that is how we grow. Um, Lastly, let's be victorious. Um, Who are the victorious ones? Um, Verse 7, those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. And it's in contrast to verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, and then it lists all sorts of things, at the end says, they will burn in the fiery lake. This is the second death. Victory is only found in one place, and it's in the presence of Jesus. We enter only by faith in him, by his death on the cross alone. And so the the place of victory is the same place that we're heading. It's drawing near to Christ each day, being reassured that we are adopted, dwelling with him now. And it says in Ephesians 2, we're already citizens of heaven. That is where we belong. We have already won victory because Christ has already died. Victory is not found in our own strength. And when we dwell in him now, and when we drink that water that he offers, his grace, that is how we grow as Christian believers. Um, So as we close, maybe this week, if you find yourself in the world thinking, This place is not as it should be. Then first for heaven. If you find yourself thinking, I long to be a bride. I long to be known. I long to be loved. I long to be understood. Then know that that is exactly who we are. And one day that will be fully realized. And if you find yourself longing to know God better and struggling to know where the deepest joy is in all the world, it is dwelling with him forever. So why not start that relationship now? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we know the end of the story. Please, we pray that we would hunger and thirst for righteousness (coughs) that only comes from you. 
Would we enjoy being in your presence now? Would we enjoy and receive uh, more fully that relationship that you offer? Help us to rejoice in it and help us to long for our eternal home with you. Amen.